I need your help with a question about a particular sentence. It asks what the sentence while severe's exemplifies. Do you know the answer? Let's go through the options together. What's the first one? The first option is entailment. Does while severe's fit this category? No, entailment refers to a relationship between statements where one statement logically follows from another. Walls have ears, doesn't logically follow from any premise. It's more figurative. Got it. The next option is metaphor. Could this be the right answer? Yes, walls have ears is definitely a metaphor. It's a figurative expression meaning that people may be listening to private conversations, suggesting that information can be overheard even in seemingly private places. That makes sense. The third option is metonymy. Is this correct? No. Metonymy involves substituting one word or phrase for another with which it's closely associated, like using the White House to refer to the U.S. president or administration. Walls have ears isn't doing that. It's using metaphorical imagery. Okay, so that's not it. The last option is lexical ambiguity. Could that be it? No, lexical ambiguity occurs when a word or phrase has more than one meaning. Walls have ears isn't about ambiguous meanings of individual words, but rather about a figurative expression. So, to summarize, the correct answer is metaphor, because walls have ears is a figurative way of saying that conversations might be overheard. Exactly. Metaphor is the right choice here. Can you help me with a question about lexical borrowing? It asks which one of the following is not a lexical borrowing. Let's look at the options. What's the first one? The first option is loan translation. Is that a form of lexical borrowing? Yes, a loan translation, or cock, is a type of lexical borrowing. It's when a phrase or compound word from another language is translated directly into the borrowing language. For example, skyscraper in English and woken kreitzer in German. Got it. The next option is cultural borrowing. Could that be the one? Yes. Cultural borrowing is not a type of lexical borrowing. It refers to the adoption of cultural elements, such as customs, practices, or even technologies, from one culture by another. It's broader than lexical borrowing, which deals specifically with words and phrases. That makes sense. The third option is loan blends. Is that a form of lexical borrowing? Yes, Loan blends are a form of lexical borrowing where a part of the word is borrowed from another language and combined with elements from the borrowing language. For instance, permapress combines permanent from English and press from English. Okay, so loan blends are definitely a type of lexical borrowing. The last option is loan words. Is this correct? Yes, loan words are directly borrowed words from one language to another without translation. Examples include pizza from Italian and kindergarten from German. So, to summarize, the correct answer is cultural borrowing, because it refers to adopting cultural elements rather than specific words or phrases. Exactly. Cultural borrowing is not a form of lexical borrowing. I have a question about analogical creations in linguistics. It asks what analogical creations are. Do you know the answer? Analogical creations refer to the process of forming new words or forms based on existing patterns in a language. They help regularize the paradigm of a language. What do you mean by regularize the paradigm? When we talk about regularizing the paradigm, we mean making irregular forms more regular by applying common patterns or rules. For example, in English, some irregular past tense forms become regular over time like helped from help following the regular pattern of adding ed for the past tense. So, analogical creations help make the language more systematic? Exactly. By applying regular patterns, analogical creations help reduce irregularities and make it easier for speakers to learn and use the language. That makes sense. So, the answer to the question would be that analogical creations are used to regularize the paradigm. Yes, that's correct. Analogical creations aim to regularize the paradigm by making irregular forms conform to more predictable patterns. I have a question about the decade of indigenous languages. Do you know which decade has been declared for this purpose? Yes, I do. The decade declared as the decade of indigenous languages is 2022 to 2032. Oh, interesting. What is the purpose of declaring a decade for indigenous languages? 
The main goal is to raise awareness about the importance of indigenous languages and to promote their preservation and revitalization. Many indigenous languages are at risk of disappearing, and this decade is an effort to support and sustain them. That sounds really important. What kind of activities or initiatives are expected during this decade? There will likely be a variety of activities, including educational programs, documentation projects, language revitalization efforts, and policies aimed at supporting indigenous language speakers. The idea is to engage communities, governments, and organizations globally. Can you help me with a question about a form of self-narrative? It asks which term describes a self-narrative that places the self within the social context. Let's look at the options. What's the first one? The first option is ethnology. Is that the right term? No, ethnology is the comparative study of cultures. It doesn't specifically focus on self-narratives within a social context. Got it. The next option is autoethnography. Could that be the correct answer? Yes, autoethnography is indeed the right term. It's a form of self-narrative that places the author within their social context, blending autobiography with ethnography to explore personal experiences in relation to cultural, social, and political contexts. That makes sense. The third option is autothonology. Is that a correct term? No, autothonology seems like a misinterpretation or a typo. It's not a recognized term in the context of self-narratives. Okay, so that's not it. The last option is ethnography. Is this the right one? No, ethnography is the systematic study of people and cultures from the perspective of the subject. While it involves social context, it doesn't focus on the self-narrative aspect as autoethnography does. So, to summarize, the correct answer is autoethnography, because it describes a self-narrative that places the self within the social context. Exactly. Autoethnography is the right choice here. I need some help with a question about interactional sociolinguistics. Do you know who the proponent of this field is? Let's go through the options. What's the first one? The first option is David Crystal. Is he the proponent of interactional sociolinguistics? No, David Crystal is a well-known linguist, but he's not specifically known for interactional sociolinguistics. He's more recognized for his work on the English language and linguistics in general. Got it. The next option is John J. Gumpers. Could he be the correct answer? Yes, John J. Gumpers is indeed the proponent of interactional sociolinguistics. He pioneered this field, focusing on how language use and social interaction influence each other. His work on conversational analysis and cross-cultural communication is foundational. That makes sense. The third option is Einar Haugen. Is he associated with interactional sociolinguistics? No, Einar Haugen is known for his contributions to the study of bilingualism and language planning, particularly in the context of Scandinavian languages. Interactional sociolinguistics isn't his primary area of focus. Okay, so that's not the right one. The last option is Joshua A. Fishman. Is he the correct one? No, Joshua A. Fishman is a prominent figure in the field of sociolinguistics, especially known for his work on language and ethnicity, language revival, and bilingual education. However, he isn't the main proponent of interactional sociolinguistics. So, to summarize, the correct answer is John J. Gumpers, because he is the proponent of interactional sociolinguistics. Exactly. John J. Gumpers is the right choice here. I have a question about identifying the odd one out among some language pairs. Can you help me figure it out? What are the options? The pairs are Hindi slash Urdu, Swedish slash Danish, Serbian slash Croatian, and Telugu slash Odia. Which one is the odd one out? Let's go through them one by one. The first pair, Hindi slash Urdu, is a bit tricky. These languages are considered mutually intelligible in their spoken forms and share a lot of vocabulary, though they use different scripts and with cultural differences. Right, and the second pair is Swedish slash Danish. Swedish and Danish are both Scandinavian languages and are quite similar. Speakers of these languages can often understand each other, making them another pair of mutually intelligible languages. That makes sense. The third pair is Serbian slash Croatian. 
Serbian and Croatian are also very similar and are often considered dialects of the same language, sometimes referred to as Serbo-Croatian. They are mutually intelligible as well. Okay, so all these pairs are mutually intelligible. What about the last pair, Telugu slash Odia? Telugu and Odia are quite different. Telugu is a Dravidian language spoken mainly in the state of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, while Odia is an Indo-Aryan language spoken in the state of Odisha. They belong to different language families and are not mutually intelligible. So, the odd one out is Telugu slash Odia, because they are not mutually intelligible like the other pairs? Exactly. Telugu slash Odia is the odd one out because they come from different language families and speakers of one language cannot understand the other. I have a question about the functions of language used in media. It asks what functions a language used in media has. Can you help me figure it out? Let's look at the options together. What's the first one? The first option is cognitive and linguistic function. Do you think that's correct? No, not quite. While language and media can involve cognitive processes, cognitive function isn't a typical way to describe the broader roles language plays in media. The term cognitive refers more to mental processes, which isn't the primary focus when discussing media language. Okay, the next option is stylistic and informative function. What about this one? This option is closer as language and media does have a stylistic aspect and is certainly used to convey information. However, it doesn't encompass all the broader functions, especially those beyond style and information. Got it. The third option is political and cultural function. Is this the right one? This is also partially correct, because media language can reflect political and cultural contexts. But it still doesn't cover all the functions language and media serves, especially the technical aspects of linguistics. So. The last option is linguistic and extralinguistic function. Could this be the correct answer? Yes, this is the most accurate option. Language and media indeed has both linguistic functions, which pertain to the structure and use of language itself, and extralinguistic functions, which involve elements beyond language, like visual and auditory components, and the broader social context in which the language is used. So, to summarize, the correct answer is linguistic and extralinguistic function, because it includes both the language structure and its broader social context. Exactly. Linguistic and extralinguistic function covers the full range of functions of language and media. I have a question about projects that deal with creating parallel sentence corpora for India's languages, including English. Do you know which one it is? Let's look at the options. What's the first one? The first option is Mother Tongue Survey of India. Is this the one? No, the Mother Tongue Survey of India focuses on documenting and surveying the various mother tongues spoken across the country. It doesn't specifically deal with creating parallel sentence corpora. Got it. The next option is Indian Languages Corporate Initiative. Could this be the correct answer? Yes, the Indian Languages Corporate Initiative ILSI, is indeed the correct one. This project involves creating parallel corporate for multiple Indian languages, including English. It aims to develop linguistic resources that can be used for various applications, such as machine translation and language research. That makes sense. The third option is Scheme for Protection and Preservation of Endangered Languages. What about this one? No, this scheme is aimed at identifying and preserving endangered languages in India. It involves documentation and revitalization efforts, but doesn't specifically focus on creating parallel corpora. Okay, so that's not it. The last option is People's Survey of India. Is this the correct one? No, the People's Survey of India is more about conducting surveys on various socio-economic aspects of the population. It doesn't focus on creating parallel sentence corpora for languages. Sure thing. The main objective is the grand quest. That is, to explore the relationship between the use of modern teaching techniques and the student performance. So, um, that's the main objective, the grand quest. To, you know, like, explore the relationship between the use of modern teaching techniques and the performance of the students after uh, having applied those modern teaching techniques on, on the students. So it's like a grand quest overall. That's 
main objective. That's the main objective. Exactly. The Indian Languages Corporate Initiative is the right choice here. I need some help with a question about universal grammar. It asks which statement is not true about its features. Can we go through the options together? The first option is universals have no exceptions. Is this true? Actually, this statement is not accurate in describing universal grammar features. While linguistic universals are general patterns or tendencies observed across languages, there can be exceptions. So, this statement being false could be a correct answer. Got it. The next option is universals are process independent. What about this one? Okay, I will tell you about it so, this statement is true. Universals in the context of universal grammar are considered to be independent of specific language processes, meaning they apply broadly across different languages without being tied to particular linguistic mechanisms. Alright folks, now we're talking about the star of the day. Who is it? Triangulation. That makes sense. The last option is universals can also be considered as typological generalizations. Is this one true? Okay, I will tell you about it. So, no, this statement is not true about the features of universal grammar. Universals in universal grammar refer to innate linguistic features shared across all human languages, while typological generalizations are empirical observations based on the study of different languages. They are not considered the same. So, to summarize, the correct answer is universals can also be considered as typological generalizations, because this is not true about the features of universal grammar. This is the statement that doesn't correctly describe the features of universal grammar.